Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I didn't exactly plan it this way, but it's certainly fitting that we begin this new sermon series on the book of Galatians on Memorial Day. Because on a day when we remember so many who sacrificed so much for our freedom, we turn to the book of Galatians, and the theme is freedom. Freedom that God so richly and deeply desires for us to have. The freedom of the gospel. And what is at stake is the perversion of the gospel and the loss of all people those whom God has loved enough to send his son into the world to save. And so as we embark on this journey, it's going to be a long journey. It is. It's going to take us all the way to September. It's a long series of sermons where we, we will hear the Apostle Paul from numerous angles, dealing with numerous issues, talk about the reality of what Jesus has done for us and the assurance of that in our lives. And it begins by laying out for us a very simple truth, that God has loved us and been gracious to us and has won for us peace through himself. We're going to be talking a lot about freedom. And freedom is is something that's very precious, but I think and I'm afraid it's something we often take for granted if we've never been without it. Some of you, and we all know people whose ancestors were slaves. While we can empathize with them, we can never really understand what it would be like to be a slave unless we ourselves have been shackled. Some of my ancestors were Cherokee and they walked the Trail of Tears. While I can certainly know the history and understand how difficult it was, I can never really identify with them because I didn't walk that path with them. Freedom is a precious gift. And yet, if we don't take it seriously, we could lose it. There are other kinds of freedom, aren't there? A woman who's been in an abusive marriage can become free, but there's much fear and much heartache to accomplish that. Someone who's addicted to drugs or alcohol can become free and celebrate freedom. But before that freedom becomes a reality, it will affect not only them, but their family and friends and everyone around them. Because freedom comes at a great price. But there is a bondage and a freedom that we can all understand. Every single one of us came into this world corrupted by sin and destined to be used by a pawn in the hand of the devil and then to spend an eternity separated from God. That is the reality of how we came into this world as sinful human beings. And Jesus has come into this world for the purpose of rescuing us from what he calls this present evil age and giving to us the freedom of knowing God, his love, and spending eternity with him. That is what God desires for us to know, what he desires for us to experience. And so the Apostle Paul writes a letter. He's been at the churches of Galatia. He served them. He ministered to them. He preached with power and authority to the churches of Galatia, and many people were saved. Now, Galatia is basically modern-day Turkey. It was a province of Rome. But then when Paul left to continue his journey, others came in. Others journeyed to the region, men from Jerusalem and other places who began to question Paul's apostleship and the message that he taught. And they began to convince the people that in order to be right with God, in order to know God, you have to keep all the laws of the Old Testament. In other words, you have to be good Jews in order to be Christians. And they perverted the message. And they robbed people of the freedom, of the grace and forgiveness that Paul had been sent to give to them. 
And so Paul writes this letter to reaffirm what he's always taught. And God ordained that this epistle be in the New Testament so we would have that same assurance that he was seeking to give the people 2,000 years ago. The truth of the freedom we have in Christ. So Paul begins this epistle very simply. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He begins by identifying himself as an apostle because those who came in after him in the churches began to question if he really was, a, was an apostle, a man who could speak for God. And so he starts with the understanding of his role, his authority that's been given to him by God. And what do you know about Paul? Paul was a good Jew. In fact, he was the rising star of Judaism. I mean, think about it. Of all the Jews in Jerusalem, of all the people the Sanhedrin could have picked, they chose Paul, Saul, to be their front runner to destroy the church and to destroy the name of Jesus. He was the go-to guy for the leadership of the Jews. Nothing was outside of his reach. He had the power and the authority to do whatever he needed to do to murder, enslave, try, and convict, and imprison those who knew Jesus. He was on top of the world until Jesus got a hold of him. On the road to Damascus, knocked off of his horse, a light shining out of the heavens, a voice of Jesus himself. And he is moved from a persecutor to a proclaimer. Now what other than God could make a man change like that? In fact, Paul's very life is a testimony to the power of the gospel in a person's life. Because no one in their right mind would choose on their own accord to go from persecutor to persecuted. No one in their right mind would choose to have everything and all the accolades of all the powerful, influential people and then choose a life where you become an enemy of all those people. And yet that's exactly what Paul did. He became an apostle and he says, not by men or from men, Men didn't do this to me, but from God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. That is the heart of Paul's message. What is the gospel? That God raised Jesus from the dead. The tomb is empty. That is the heart of the message. That Jesus Christ came in this world to suffer and die upon the cross to pay for sins. And that God has accepted his sacrifice. And how do you know he accepted it? Because he raised him to life again. He raised him from the dead. The tomb is empty. That's how you know God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. And that means that everything Jesus did was sufficient, was complete. It was enough because God approved it by raising him from the dead. And anyone who would add, add anything to what Jesus did or take anything away from it is perverting the message and taking a stand against the Father, because the Father said it's enough by raising him from the dead. And in Paul's day, there were those who were undermining that truth, who were adding to and taking away and nullifying the gospel and leaving people in doubt and despair and robbing them of the freedom that Jesus died to give them. And Paul wants his readers to know that it is not right, that the gospel is pure and complete in and of itself. It needs nothing else. And that is the same thing that God wants you to know today. So he affirms his apostleship. He speaks of the reality of the heart of the message that Jesus is alive, the Father raised him from the dead. And then he says, grace to you and peace. Grace is a very simple thing, and yet it is an enormously profound thing. We teach it to our children, grace is God's undeserved love. That's a simple definition. Anyone can understand that. But what is profound about it is that God, God himself in heaven, would love us and be gracious to us. 
And what are we? God's sinful, rebellious creation. Undeserving of anything. I mean, think about it. God gave us perfect, a perfect creation, and what did we do? We destroyed it. God gives us life, and we squander it. God gives us blessings untold, and we mock it. God gives us freedom, and we use it to abuse others. God creates heaven for us, and we choose hell. And yet, in spite of everything that we have done, God has not and will not stop loving us. That is grace. That is grace. That in spite of all that we are or all that we do, God will always love us. Grace in the heart of God moved him to send Jesus into the world. And if grace is from the Father, and it is, then peace is made possible through the Son. Jesus came into this world to rescue us from what he says, this present evil age. The world is evil. All you do is turn on the television set, flip on the computer, or open a newspaper. I mean, crime fills our streets. Families are falling apart. Children are going hungry. I mean, Friday morning, 28 Christians were slaughtered in a bomb blast simply because they believe in Jesus. The world is evil. And Jesus came to rescue us. And in order to rescue us, it means he has to provide the means by which to take us out of danger to a place of safety. To rescue us and set us free. There was a soldier, I don't know the timing, but a soldier was in a cafe and his shirt sleeve was folded up and pinned. He's sitting at the counter and a guy came in sitting beside him and eating breakfast and he turned to the soldier and said, let me ask you something. How did it feel losing your arm in war? And the man looked right at him and said, I did not lose my arm in war. I gave my arm for my country. You see, a sacrifice that is made willingly is a gift. The soldier willingly gave his arm for his country. Jesus did not go to the cross and have his life taken from him. He went to the cross and willingly gave himself into death. Why? To rescue us from this present evil age, to deliver us out of danger, to set us free. And the cost was the cross, where he willingly gave his life into death so that we could be forgiven. And with the forgiveness he won upon the cross, there is peace. Grace brings peace. Grace from the heart of the Father and peace through the sacrifice of the Son. Two little boys were playing on the riverbank. And some of you have seen it over in Louisiana, the places where when, when storms come and floodwaters recede and sand is piled up high and there's big sand dunes to play in. And the two brothers are running up and down the sand dunes playing on the riverbank. And they run up to the top of one of them. And without knowing it, before they realize it, they begin to sink because the sand hasn't settled. And it's shifting under their feet. And they're sinking and they're literally being sucked into the sand. Well, lunch came and they didn't come home. Supper came, and they didn't come home. And the parents got some neighbors and went out searching for them. And they found the youngest brother buried up almost to his shoulders in the sand, just his shoulders and head sticking out. And they began to dig him out. And as they got down close to his waist, he came too. And they asked him, where's your older brother? And he told them, I'm standing on his shoulders. You see, the older brother sacrificed his life to hold up and to lift up the one who was in danger. Jesus came into this world to sacrifice his life, to to go down into the pit of this sinful world to pick us up and lift us up and bring us out of danger and give us life. That's what the cross is. And he did it willingly because the Father loves you, because the Father wants you, And he's offered to you a place of safety, a place of security, a place where you can experience God's love and know the freedom of the gospel, that you don't have to do it 
because Jesus did it for you. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is accept the gift. But the sad truth is, so many hear about the gift and they don't want it. They turn away from it. It just doesn't seem meaningful to them. And that's why I can stand here today and tell you that I think there's a lot of times we take freedom for granted because we don't really understand what life would be without it. In 2005, when Hurricane Katrina just destroyed New Orleans, the city was almost completely underwater. And long before the news helicopters got there and long before the National Guard could be mobilized and go in to help, the Coast Guard went in. They were the first ones in. I mean, as soon as the storm cleared, they were there. And they were using their helicopters and their boats to rescue people who were, who were in peril. I mean, they were going to die. And one helicopter pilot and his crew wrote a report about their experiences. The first three trips in, they literally saved 89 people, three dogs, and two cats. Their fourth trip in, they saved zero, no one. It's not because... There weren't people that needed to be rescued. But in the area of the grid they were given, those who wanted out had gotten out, and those who were there refused their help. I mean, they would hover over houses, and on the loudspeaker say, we're here to help you, and they say, we don't want to leave. We want to stay here, on top of their garages, on top of their houses, on top of buildings. They refused to leave. The, the Coast Guard said, the floodwaters are still rising. It's still dangerous. You need to get out. I said, no, we're staying. Just bring us food and water and we'll be okay. And many of them died. Many of them perished in the waters of the flood because they refused to leave. How many people are there like that in this world who have the opportunity for freedom to be rescued I said, no, no, we'll stay right here. I just want all my needs met until I die. So many people hear the offer and reject it. And yet God comes and offers freedom. Today's the day for you to understand what God wants of you. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow may be too late. Tomorrow you may perish. Today's the day for you to understand that God has been gracious to you. That out of a gracious, loving heart, He sent Jesus to be your Savior. Today's the day for you to understand that Jesus has sacrificed, willingly given Himself into death to lift you up to freedom so you can have peace with God. Because the day is the day that God wants you to understand there's nothing more important to his heart than you. That he loves you and that he wants you. He offers you freedom as a gift. All you have to do is receive it. Over the next several weeks, we're going to hear a lot about grace, about peace, and about what God has done to rescue you as his children. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and a life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.